Hello friends, my name is Malvika Seth and I am an assistant professor at OP Jindal Global University. This module is titled Economic, Social and Cultural Rights as Positive Rights. Traditionally, human rights have been divided into two categories. First, civil and political rights and second, economic, social and cultural rights. This division emerged from a political dispute between the Western and Eastern blocs during the Cold War resulting in two major human rights treaties, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that is ICCPR, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that is the ICESCR. In addition to this political divide, the two sets of rights have also been separated on grounds of justiciability. It has long been argued that civil and political rights are more readily enforceable in court because they are more clearly defined and do not involve complex questions of resource allocation. Economic, social and cultural rights by contrast were thought to be beyond the province of courts and better left to legislatures. This module will introduce students to the debates surrounding positive and negative rights and argue that the distinction was largely invented for political reasons but in fact all human rights have both positive and negative aspects. The expected learning outcomes of this module are as follows. After completing this module, the students should know and understand first, the historical origins of the positive versus negative rights distinction. Second, the theoretical basis of this distinction. And third, how the distinction is flawed and all rights have both positive and negative dimensions. The first part of the module is titled the historical origins of positive and negative rights distinction. The distinction between positive and negative rights dates back at least to the great philosopher Ezra Berlin. In an influential lecture titled Two Concepts of Liberty delivered at the University of Oxford in 1958, Berlin famously distinguished between positive and negative liberty. This lecture was later published in 1969, volume entitled Four Essays on Liberty. Berlin defined negative liberty much as we do today, stating that it involving an answer to the question, what is the area within which the subject, a person or group of persons, is or should be left to do or be what he is able to do or be without interference by other persons. However, his definition of positive liberty was far different. Berlin drew from Aristotle to define this kind of liberty as permitting participation in self-government and enabling full political citizenship. Thus, it is not the freedom from government intervention, but freedom as self-mastery 
to be an active participant in choosing the life you will lead and deciding by whom you will be governed. While this positive liberty is not connected to economic and social justice, Berlin's terminology has been co-opted and applied in that context. In international human rights law, the distinction between positive and negative rights emerged out of political dispute during the Cold War. The UN Commission on Human Rights, that is the CHR, was created in 1946 to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. Since the UDHR was an aspirational declaration that did not have any legally binding force, the CHR was later authorized to draft a covenant, also known as treaty, that would elaborate on the rights in the UDHR and give them legal force. Negotiations over this covenant took place against the backdrop of the Cold War, which pitted the Western Bloc, which comprised of the United States and Western Europe, against the Eastern Bloc, which comprised of the Soviet Union and other socialist states. The Western Bloc favored two separate covenants. They argued that civil and political rights were fundamentally different from economic, social and cultural rights. In particular, they believed that economic, social and cultural rights were more difficult to implement and enforce. The Eastern Bloc, however, sought to preserve economic, social and cultural rights within a single covenant, arguing that all human rights are indivisible and interdependent. In the end, the CHR drafted two separate conventions that were introduced in 1966 and came into force in 1976. These conventions are the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, that is the ICCPR, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, that is the ICESCR. The Western Bloc endorsed the ICCPR while the ICESCR received support from the Eastern Bloc. Today, while most countries in the international community have ratified both treaties, the historical division between the blocs can still be seen. For instance, the United States has not ratified the ICESCR, while China, which maintains a communist government whose political views roughly align with the former Eastern Bloc has not ratified the ICCPR. The second part of the module discusses the theoretical distinction between positive and negative rights. The distinction between negative and positive rights is rooted in the nature of the two sets of rights. Civil and political rights are categorized as negative rights, while economic, social and cultural rights are characterized as positive rights. This section defines what is traditionally meant by negative and positive rights and sets forth the theoretical basis for this particular distinction. Negative rights do not impose an obligation on others to provide an individual with any benefit or access to a benefit. These rights permit individuals to perform certain activities and ensure that there is no interference of this right 
by others. The term negative is used because these rights are intended to impose restrictions on the state, in particular from interfering in citizens' enjoyment of certain individual freedoms. For instance, the First Amendment of the United States Constitution guarantees the right to freedom of speech without abridgment or interference from government. Thus, negative rights are sometimes called liberty rights and can be understood as protecting liberty against government and third party interference. Civil and political rights in theory fall into this category. If a state must respect your freedom of speech and assembly and refrain from taking your life or personal liberty without due process of law, it is merely abstaining from action. In other words, mere inaction on part of the state is traditionally believed to be adequate to hold civil and political rights. This conception of rights has been forcefully defended by Frank B. Cross, an American law professor. According to Cross, the distinction between positive and negative rights makes sense and he proposes a test to prove this. He says, in quotes, I propose the following simple test for distinguishing between positive and negative rights. If there was no government in existence, would the right be automatically fulfilled? If there is a government in place, one must call upon that government to enforce one's rights, whether positive or negative. However, the negative right is not dependent upon government in the sense that the abolition of government would intrinsically satisfy the right. In other words, if there is no government, it cannot establish a religion, pass a law denying free speech, or deprive its citizens of life, liberty, or property without due process. However, Cross argues that positive rights will not be fulfilled if government did not exist. In his view, economic and social justice issues like homelessness or a lack of health care would persist even if there were no government. Thus, positive rights impose obligations on others, particularly government, to take affirmative action to remedy violations. On this theory, economic, social and cultural rights fall into the category of positive rights. They are aimed at fulfilling certain material needs such as food, water and shelter as well as providing access to the cultural life of the community. They are therefore positive in the sense that they would not be fulfilled merely through government inaction. The government must take positive steps towards securing these rights. On this account, positive rights lack the legal force of negative rights. Positive rights are cast as policy directives that do not give rise to legally binding duties and obligations. Indeed, they are often drafted in aspirational terms and subject to progressive realization. Part 4 of the Indian Constitution 
demonstrates all these features of positive rights. The directive principles of state policy contained in part 4 include a range of policy objectives for the state to pursue progressively and in light of resource constraints. For instance, Article 38 subclause 2 provides, in court, the state shall in particular strive to minimize the inequalities in income. Quote close. A final distinction is that negative rights are theoretically justiciable, while positive rights are not. There are usually two arguments offered in support of this particular position. First, that economic, social and cultural rights involve complex questions of resource allocation that are beyond the ken of judges. And second, that economic, social and cultural right cases involve the judiciary in policy questions that are the province of the legislature and not the judiciary. For all these reasons, negative and positive rights are considered theoretically separate and distinct. Some of the differences between negative and positive rights are as follows. First, negative rights do not impose obligations on others to provide benefits or access to benefits. Whereas, positive rights imposes obligation on others, usually the state, to provide material needs or access to material needs. Second, negative rights ensure that there is no interference by others, particularly the state, in one's enjoyment of rights. Whereas, positive rights require the state to take affirmative steps to fulfill rights. Third, negative rights are legally binding. Whereas, positive rights are not strictly binding as they are subject to progressive realization. Fourth, negative rights are enforceable in court. Whereas, positive rights are not enforceable in court. And the fifth difference being that negative rights are civil and political rights which are also known as liberty rights, whereas positive rights are economic, social and cultural rights, also known as the welfare rights. The third part of the module discusses the traditional distinction and how to move beyond the same between positive and negative rights. In the previous section, we looked at the traditional distinction between positive and negative rights and how economic, social and cultural rights are generally classified as positive rights. This section seeks to criticize this distinction in three ways. First, that civil and political rights have some positive aspects. Second, that economic, social and cultural rights have some negative aspects. And third, that all human rights are interdependent and the distinction between positive and negative rights ignores this core idea. In basic rights, subsistence, affluence and US foreign policy, Henry Shu put forth one of the first comprehensive criticisms of the positive-negative rights distinction. He noted that even so-called negative rights, what he called security rights, require positive government action to be upheld. As he put it, 
the right to physical security is not a demand to be left alone but rather a demand to be protected against harm if the government is to enforce civil and political rights such as the right to life and liberty it must hire and pay police officers prosecutors and judges in addition such enforcement requires the government to pay for infrastructure like court rooms and police stations the same can be said of the right to free speech the police are required to protect unpopular speakers from violent acts and control crowds in public demonstrations in the second bill of rights Cass Sunstein goes even further than Shu in arguing that enforcement of civil and political rights requires government intervention. Sunstein, in particular, targets Lazarus Fair, the theory that economic markets work most effectively with no government intervention. Drawing from the insights of American legal realists, Sunstein argues that no one actually opposes government intervention. Even those individuals who desire less regulated markets or lower taxes actually directly benefit from government spending. After all, if there were no police forces, or courts the wealth that these individuals accumulated could simply be taken away by others without any recourse moreover sunstein says that even the most basic assumptions on which economies function that wealth is represented by money and that we have individual property in that money or the monetary value of our assets are created and enforced by government money property and ownership are entirely human creations that governments uphold not only by protecting us from others but by printing money and by operating a legal system that recognizes the value of our money and assets he writes in quote economic value does not predate law it is created by law quote close thus the enforcement of any right be it the freedom of speech the right to life or property rights depends on the proper functioning of government institutions and are therefore not free but rather involve a substantial cost if civil and political rights have positive aspects economic social and cultural rights have negative aspects too on a practical level this is more evident with some economic social and cultural rights than with others take cultural rights for example they are protected within the iccpr and the icescr while article 27 of the iccpr protects the right of minorities to profess and practice their culture article 15 of the icescr requires states to recognize the right of all citizens to take part in cultural life and benefit from the protection of moral and material interests emanating from authorship of literary artistic or scientific works the right to education is similar in this respect article 18 of the iccpr requires state to have respect for the liberty of parents 
or legal guardians to ensure the religious and moral education of their children in conformity with their own convictions. Meanwhile, Article 13 of the ICESCR requires inter alia that the state provide free and compulsory primary education to all children. Both these rights therefore have both negative and positive aspects. Other economic, social and cultural rights also have negative aspects even if they are less apparent. The right to food at first glance appears to be a wholly positive right. After all, if individuals do not have adequate food or access to food, the government must take affirmative steps to provide food to them. But the right to food does not just involve government handouts or subsidies, it also protects individual food supplies or access to food from others interference. For instance, if a farmer grows his own food and a third party destroys his crops, his right to food is infringed. Therefore, the government must protect farmers crops from private acts of destruction. In this sense, the right to food is much like a civil and political right. The government must operate law enforcement and legal systems to protect the food supplies of each citizen just as they would protect the right to free speech or personal liberty. On a more fundamental level, the positive-negative rights distinction is problematic because it conflicts with our understanding of international human rights. Since the UDHR in 1948, it has been widely agreed that human rights are indivisible and interconnected. The deprivation of some rights often leads to the deprivation of others. Which is why states must strive to uphold all rights and, in general, should not prioritize certain rights over others. The rights contained in the ICESCR are subject to progressive realization, but that does not mean that they are lesser rights. Indeed, Serious economic and social inequality not only violates economic, social and cultural rights but also directly contributes to the civil and political rights violations. For instance, a starving or severely malnourished person is unlikely to vote, participate in cultural or social life or even be able to exercise her freedom of speech. A homeless person living on the street is not just deprived of the right to housing, she also does not enjoy the right to personal liberty, security or a dignified life. Thus, the distinction between negative and positive rights is deeply problematic and in many ways is misleading to the nature of the economic, social and cultural rights. It is still important to know and understand the distinction. However, as it persists today in the academic literature and for political reasons, it explains the dichotomy between civil and political rights in the ICCPR and economic, social and cultural rights in the ICESCR. This is an important feature of the international human rights architecture as we know of it today. To summarize this module, the distinction between positive and negative rights emerged from Isaiah Berlin's 1958 lecture on the two concepts of liberty.
Berlin's conception morphed into the form we know today due to a political conflict in the Cold War era. Following the adoption of the UDHR in 1948, the Western and Eastern blocs could not agree on a single human rights covenant to give legal force to the UDHR's provisions. The UN Commission on Human Rights, therefore, drafted two separate covenants, that is, the ICCPR and the ICESCR, which divided civil and political rights from economic, social and cultural rights. The former were understood to be negative rights, while the latter were classified as positive rights. The theoretical distinction between positive and negative rights has largely focused on the role government plays in the rights enforcement. Frank Cross, for instance, has argued that civil and political, that is negative rights, can be fulfilled simply by government inaction or in the absence of government while economic, social and cultural rights require positive state action to be enforced. Other differences between the rights are first that economic, social and cultural rights are usually framed as policy directives and or are subject to progressive realization while civil and political rights are not and second that economic, social and cultural rights are non-justiciable because they involve complex issues of resource allocation that are beyond the scope of judicial competence and are best left to the legislatures. However, in at least three ways, the positive-negative rights distinction is problematic. First, the so-called negative rights have important positive dimensions. The state must employ police forces, prosecutors and judges to enforce rights to liberty and free speech. Moreover, even the most fundamental aspects of property, ownership and economic value are created by the government. So even those who supposedly oppose government interference actually strongly support the sort of intervention that allows them to retain their property and accumulate wealth. Second, positive rights like economic, social and cultural rights also include negative aspects which require the government, for instance, not to discriminate against minority cultures and to protect the food supplies of citizens from the destructive acts of third parties. Finally, all human rights form part of an indivisible and interdependent scheme. If states were to enforce only civil and political rights but not economic, social and cultural rights, it might lead to large social and economic inequalities that would lead to civil and political rights deprivations as well. After all, people who are starving or homeless do not have their rights to liberty or to a dignified life upheld either. Thank you.